All of us experience difficulties at one time or another. And regardless of what it is, whether it's slight or usually more severe, we naturally ask a couple of questions. Why is this happening? You ever done that? Or more pointedly, why is this happening to me? Uh, there are several times uh, when you do what is right and then things go wrong and that makes the situation even worse. You try to do what's right, you try to live for the Lord, and yet that very act of doing what's right can bring suffering into your life, at least negative consequences. And you can't help but think, what in the world is going on? Is, it, is this the way it's supposed to be? Isn't this a little odd or strange? I'm doing what's right and things go wrong. What is going on? So let me ask, when that kind of thing happens to you, what should be our attitude, or for that matter, our actions, especially if we are suffering for righteousness sake or for Christ's sake? In the scripture, many people experience that kind of thing, and Peter was among them. Among other things, Peter was tossed in prison. So when he wrote his first epistle, he addressed this very subject. As a matter of fact, if you read it just casually, you will see how often this crops up. He's addressing not one church, but a number of different churches, many, possibly as many as 10. And so this is a wide experience. It's the experience of a number of people. So in his epistle, he talks about hostility and even violent oppositions in many places. Sometimes the opposition is stirred up by unbelieving Jews. Sometimes the persecution is by local officials. Uh, we can glean all of that, not only from his first epistle, but from what is recorded in the book of Acts. So, Peter addresses the subject of doing what is right and having things go all wrong. Now, uh, to varying degrees in this book, there are formal and informal persecutions. And he is talking about how to handle that. Now, he's done this in a number of paragraphs. This is the last paragraph in which he talks about it. And in this paragraph that I'm going to introduce in a minute, he discusses two aspects of this. On one level, he talks about what will happen or to him, to the person, the believer being persecuted, and then he talks about to the person, about the person doing the persecution. So, with that in mind, will you turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4? We're going to pick up where we left off at verse 12. 1 Peter 4, 12. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trials which uh, is to try you as though something strange has happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you are partakers of Christ's suffering and uh, when his glory is revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. But the, for the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, 
Where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. As I mentioned a moment ago, Peter does two things in this paragraph. He speaks to those who are suffering, and he speaks about those who are causing the suffering. So let's start with verse 12, where he's speaking to believers who are suffering one way or another. I think it's fascinating that he starts this paragraph with the little word, beloved. Beloved. I'd like to camp there for about an hour. You know, the more I live and the more I talk with people, the more I am persuaded that one of the deepest needs in life is just to know you're beloved. You're just beloved. Especially when things go all along and you feel all alone. You just need to know you are beloved. Beloved by the Father and beloved by other believers. So he says, beloved. Obviously, that would include the Lord. And by him addressing them, it includes him. So he just says, you need to know you're loved. You just need to know you're loved, no matter what you're going through. Then he talks about that. He says, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trials. Wow. There's a, this is a trial. And he calls it fiery. Now, why fiery? Well, it burns. <laughs> Trials hurt. They burn. Now, there's a positive side to that and a negative side to that. The negative side is that the trial hurts. The positive side, when it's done, burns out the dross. And in that sense, the fiery trial can be positive. In this particular case, he's talking about suffering for Christ's sake. As a matter of fact, throughout this passage, he talks about that. He says in verse 13, but rejoice to the extent that you are partakers of Christ's suffering. So the trial in verse 12 has to do with suffering for Christ. Look at verse 14. If you are reproached for the name of Christ. So part of the persecution is that you're being slandered he says in verse 16, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, and again in verse 19, therefore those who suffer according to the will of God. So throughout the paragraph, he talks about suffering for Christ, and that clearly is the fiery trial that he's talking about in verse 12. Now his point, his first point is, don't think that strange. Now, I think that's our natural tendency, especially if you're suffering for Christ's sake. And earlier in the book, he talked about suffering for righteousness' sake. Yeah, I'm doing what's right. I'm following the Lord. Why, why should I be the object of slander and be talked against, which is reproached, which is the kind of thing that's going on. He said, well, don't think it's strange. He says, uh, verse 13, but rejoice to the extent you are partakers of Christ's suffering. So don't think it's strange. If you're following Christ, you're going to suffer. Now, let me pause. This is very important. Why did the Lord leave you here? Why don't you just take your home? I, give, I ask people that all the time. They give me all kinds of answers. Like, well, I'm here to serve the Lord. All right, why can't you do that in heaven? Uh, well, I'm here to win people to Christ. Let me just tell you, angels could do a better job. In Galatians chapter 1, Paul contemplates that possibility of angels doing it. Why do he leave you here? If you miss everything I say today, Next week, next month, and next year, get this. This is very important. The Lord left us here to conform us to Christ. 
Now, that takes trials. And that's what's going on. Now, you want to be conformed to Christ? Now, let me tell you what that's like. He got crucified. He got slandered. They said he was a wine-bibber and a glutton. They said he was possessed of the devil. Still want to be conformed to Christ? That is what you have to go through. I will never forget preaching years ago through the Gospel of John. I was sitting in my study alone, and it hit me. Jesus got denied, betrayed, and deserted. By his apostles. And I looked at that and I thought, oh no, that's what I got to go through. I have to be denied, betrayed, and deserted if I'm to be conformed to Christ. And that's what Peter's talking about that you are experiencing the sufferings of Christ. That's part of being conformed to Christ. Paul says that I may know him. We love that. And the power of his resurrection. We really like that. But you know what the rest of that verse says in Philippians 3.10? And the fellowship of his suffering. Wow. But if you're going to know him, you're going to be liking, you have to be alive again. And that's not fun. But that's what Peter's talking about. So the point he's making is, don't think it strange or that something strange is happening to you. If you are following Christ, that's what's going to happen. They that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It is going to happen. So, all right. So what do I do? Grin and bear it? I don't like it. It hurts. It's fire. It burns. So what am I supposed to do? Oh, it gets real interesting. Look at verse 13. Rejoice. What? That's what he says. Rejoice. Rejoice to the extent that you are partakers of Christ's suffering. So if you're suffering a little bit, you rejoice. The greater the suffering, the greater the joy of rejoicing. And here's why. When his glory is revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. Wow. Peter was present when Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said up front and personal. Rejoice. With exceeding joy, when you are persecuted, for great is your reward in heaven. And that's what he's saying in this verse. If you are a partaker of the suffering of Christ, when his glory is revealed, you will be greatly rewarded in heaven. Wow. So that's what you're to do. Matter of fact, James says, when you fall into all kinds of trials, rejoice. Now, that's not to say that it isn't painful. Matter of fact, in this very book, 1 Peter, he says in chapter 1 that it is painful. He's not denying that. Neither is James. Neither is Jesus. They are just saying, but when you look at the long haul, you can rejoice because you know that you are going to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. So take the long view, don't be short-sighted. Now, he goes on to say in verse 14, If you have reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory, and he just talked about that in verse 13, and the Spirit of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed. On your part, he is glorified. Now, this verse is just full, and we need to talk about what it's teaching. He says, if you are responding properly to this, 
you are blessed. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, he's assuming now you're rejoicing, verse 13, you are blessed. God is blessing you. And the spirit of glory, now that's going to be revealed in the future. But that's on you. You are being prepared for the glory that comes when the Lord comes back. And the Spirit of God is upon you. Now that is particularly significant. For the Spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. Uh, several times in this series I've mentioned the work of the Holy Spirit. And um, I, uh, I think, matter of fact, somebody said to me recently, you ought to do a series on the Holy Spirit. You ought to explain. The work. How many of you would like, like me to do a series on the Holy Spirit? Uh, how many would you not like for me to do <laughs> I think when I get done with First Peter, I'm going to do that. Okay? Uh, now, in the meantime, let me say that Jesus said, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So one of the things the Holy Spirit does is give us power. And it comes when we do simply trust the Lord for his grace. Now, I will go into that later in more detail when I go through a series on the Holy Spirit. But just right now, what you need to know is that no matter what you're going through, if you trust the Lord, he will give you the grace to do it. And that comes through the Holy Spirit. And that's what Peter is saying. The Holy Spirit rests upon you. So, look at this. Verse 14. If you're partakers of the name of Christ, and we're assuming you're rejoicing, verse 13, you're blessed. Why? Because the Spirit of glory, the Holy Spirit is resting upon you, and that's going to be glory for you when you stand before Christ, and the Spirit of God rests upon you to give you the power to do it. And on their part, they are blaspheming you and therefore the Lord. And on your part, he is glorified. Ooh, what is it to glorify the Lord? We talk about that all the time. Glorify the Lord. What does that mean? Well, some of you have heard me talk about this before. But Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will not speak of himself. He will take of mine and show it unto you. So uh, Jesus said, he will glorify me. He'll not speak of himself. He'll glorify me by taking what's mine and showing it to you. That's glorifying God. You show what Jesus is like. So you're being lied about. You're being reproached. You're being persecuted for Christ's sake or for righteousness sake or for whatever, and what should you do? Glorify the Lord. That's what you should do. Manifest love and gentleness and meekness, kindness, do good. So it doesn't matter what they do. It doesn't matter who they are. I'm going to do what the Lord told me to do. I'm going to manifest the Lord to you no matter what you do to me. And what I get is joy now because I can rejoice now because I'm going to be rewarded when I stand before the Lord. Got it? Wow. All right. Let's keep going. He says in verse 15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Now, he's talking about suffering, and he's saying, now, you can also suffer for your, it's your own fault. So don't, don't let this suffering be because you did something stupid or sinful. But make sure the suffering is because you're following the Lord and doing what's right. Now, I want to talk about verse 15 for a minute. I want you to look at it. But let none of you suffer. What's the next word? 
as. All right, keep that in mind. Murderer, thief, evildoer, or what's the next word? As. as. The presence of that little word as twice indicates that he's really talking about two groups of sins or two types of sins. The little word as divides the group. In the first group, there are three sins, and in the second group, there's only one sin. So let's talk about it. Don't murder anybody. Did you ever think about doing that? <laughs> Don't lie, you're in church. <laughs> um, well, that's not the real question. If you haven't thought about doing it, I wonder how long you've lived. Uh, all right, but uh, let me ask you a question. Could a, could a Christian murder somebody? I mean, could a Christian really do that? You know, there are a lot of preachers, this is very popular today, that say if you were to do something like that, that's proof that you were never saved. You ever heard anybody preach like that? Oh, I have. Well, let me just tell you, this verse is saying you could commit er murder. He, who is he talking to? Christians. Christians? You could steal. Could a Christian steal? Yes. Oh, yeah. Or evil door. Just throw in the whole pile. Oh, yeah. Whatever evil you want to mention. Peter is clearly saying that it is possible for a Christian to commit any one of those three sins. So to say a Christian couldn't do that is simply to ignore the plain teaching of Scripture. Now his point is you shouldn't do that. Right. You should, because there are consequences and you will suffer the consequences. But the point is you could, and he said, you should not. Then he throws in, I just think this is most fascinating, being a busybody. Now what's fascinating to me is that probably the worst sin you could commit is murder, right? So he, the, these sins, if you consider all four of them, start at the top and get lesser and lesser. So murder and stealing and evil and then just being a busybody. He puts being a busybody in the same verse as being a murderer and a thief. Right. You know any busybodies? You ever been a busybody? <laughs> well he says there are consequences to that. You could suffer being a busybody. Don't recommend that. And so his point in verse 15 is don't suffer because of your sin, whether it we consider it a little sin or a big sin, but if you're going to suffer, make sure it's because of serving the Lord. Then he says this, verse 16, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. Now, <laughs> don't sin. And don't be shamed. Now, if you sin, what happens? The consequences is shame when you get caught. So if you do something right, you're following Christ and you suffer, well, don't be, shameful. Don't be ashamed of that. But rather, glorify God. Now, that's the second time he said this in this passage. Verse 14, but on your part, he is glorified. Now verse 16, but let him glorify God in this matter. The point again is what you are to do is don't think it's strange, be rejoice, and glorify God. Now that just says it all. Just glorify God. Uh, that probably includes uh, praising the Lord but it certainly includes manifesting who he is. All right, how are we doing? Got this? Are you um, having difficulties right now? Going through a trial right now? 
So what are you to do? Don't think it's strange. Rejoice, because you're going to get rewarded later. And in the meantime, glorify the Lord. Reveal to people who he is. Got it? Amen. Well, what about this character that's doing the persecuting? What happens to him? Well, he discusses that. So let's pick it up at verse 17. He says, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, there are two thoughts going on here, and I need to separate them and talk about each one of them. The first one is that um, judgment is going to begin at the house of God. Now, I, I find that very interesting because if you read the Bible carefully, you will discover that throughout it talks about that very thing. Matter of fact, the prophets in the Old Testament uh, does it. For example, um, in the Isaiah says, Therefore it shall come to pass when the Lord has performed all his works on Mount Zion in Jerusalem that he will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the glory in his haughty looks, Isaiah chapter 10. In other words, I'm going to start with Jerusalem, and then I'm going to go get Assyria. That's Isaiah. Jeremiah says, For behold, I begin to bring calamity on the city which is called by my name. And should you be utterly unpunished, you shall not be unpunished. For I will call for a sword on all the inhabitants of the earth says the Lord. So I'm going to punish Israel, and when I get done, I'm going to judge everybody on the whole planet. Ezekiel says, Utterly slay old and young men, maidens and little children, women, but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark being at my sanctuary. So they begin with the elder and were that were before the temple. Same basic idea. He's going to start by judging the believers. Matter of fact, the book of Revelation is about judgment. You can't read that book without being struck by that. Uh, I think that it's a revelation of Jesus as judge. Matthew reveals Jesus as king of the Jews. Mark reveals him as a servant. Luke reveals him as the son of man. John reveals him as the son of God. And the book of Revelation is a revelation of Jesus as judge. Well, beginning at about verse 4 and going down through, uh, I mean, chapter 4, going down through chapter 18, there is one judgment right after another poured out on the world. There are the sealed judgments and the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments, and there's seven of each. Over and over and over and over again, God judges the earth. But he starts in chapters 2 and 3 judging the church. Now, I just gave you an outline of the whole book of Revelation. Chapter 1 reveals Jesus as judge. Chapters 2 and 3, he judges the church. Chapters 4 through 18, he's judging the world. And in chapter 19, he comes back. In chapter 20, he sets up the kingdom. All right? The point is, throughout the scripture, in the Old Testament prophets, all the way to the book of Revelation, God judges, and he starts with believers. Now, that's one thought in this verse, but look at it again. He says in verse 17, For the time has come to judge, for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, stop. <clears throat> that's interesting. Throughout this passage, he has been talking about us suffering, right? Now he's calling it judgment. That's the subject of the paragraph. And what was this judgment, this suffering like? Back up in verse 12, it was called a fiery trial. So his point is that it's going to begin with us, and it can be rough and rugged. Now, look at verse 17 carefully. If it's going to be rough and rugged on us, 
What will the end be to those who obey not the gospel of God? If we're having a hard time, can you imagine what it's going to be like on unbelievers? And in the context, he's talking about people who are persecuting believers. Boy, are they in for it. Now, let me tell you what their big problem is besides persecuting believers. They didn't obey the gospel of God. What's the gospel of God? By the way, how, uh, this would be a real interesting fun. Take out a three by five card. Could you write down what the gospel is? Could you write, there's only one passage in all the Bible that defines the gospel. You know what passage that is? It starts out, I declare to you the gospel. You know where it is? First Corinthians 15. You get an A today. She gets an apple. All right, what does 1 Corinthians 15 say? It says Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried and he was raised from the dead the third day according to the scriptures and that he arose or that he ascended. It says that four times in 1 Corinthians 15. That Christ died. That Christ was buried. That Christ arose. That Christ ascended. Between, beside two of those, it says according to the scriptures. It says he died for our sins according to the scripture. It says he arose for according to the scripture. Then it says he died and was buried. It doesn't say according to the scripture. It says he was buried. And it says he arose and ascended, but it doesn't say according to the scripture. So why did he mention buried and ascended? And the answer is he died for our sins, and the proof that he died is he was buried. And he arose from the dead, and the proof that he arose is we saw him ascended. So your irreducible minimum in that passage of the gospel is two things. Christ died for our sins and arose from the dead. That's the gospel. Two things. We often say the gospel is Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Technically, it's two things. He died for our sins and arose from the dead. Now, Peter says what these people didn't do is they didn't obey the gospel. What do you have to do to obey the gospel? The gospel is something about Christ. He died, he arose. What do I, what do I have to do? What, I mean, what's that got to do with me obeying? And the answer is God commands all men everywhere to repent, which means change their mind, among other things, about Christ. And it, he commands, Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So God commands all people everywhere to trust Christ who died for their sins and arose from the dead. Now what Peter is saying is they didn't do that. They don't know the Lord. And to make matters worse, they're persecuting people who do. And so it's going to really be bad for them on two counts. Number one, they didn't trust the Lord. And number two, they were mistreating God's children. And he does not take kindly to that. The Father will even the score. So, here's what's going on. The, power, the point of the passage is, I am suffering. I did what was right, and I'm suffering. So what he says is, let me talk about you. You rejoice. Don't think it's strange. You just rejoice and glorify God. Let me tell you about them. God will deal with them. So what is our natural tendency when somebody hurts us? Real simple. We want to retaliate. That's where the murder comes in. Right? So he says, look, don't retaliate. Don't get even. Don't strike back. I'll take care of that. It's going to be a lot worse for them than they made it for you. That's the point of verse 17. So he says, now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, what will the ungodly and the sinners appear? Where will the ungodly and the sinners appear? In other words, and by the way, this is a, a reference to Proverbs 11.31. And he's simply saying, uh, if the righteous one is severe, scarcely saved, and the idea is the fiery trial back up in verse 12, we're scarcely saved with difficulty, then think how 
tough it's going to be on the ungodly and the sinner. If we go through trials that are fiery, their fire is going to last a lot longer. So, I've said two things in this passage so far. Got it? You need it? You need it? All right. You remember it. Don't think it's strange. Glorify God. That's basically the idea. Rejoice and glorify God. That's one. Number two, what do you do with the person? Do you retaliate? Do you get even? No. You let the Lord do that, and he will do a whole lot better job than you will. So, what is the bottom line? He says, therefore, this is the conclusion. Let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. All right, this is another thing. He actually goes back to the people who are suffering, and he says, here's what you need to do. If you're suffering according to the will of God, now why did he say that? Because you could suffer according to your sin. So if you're suffering according to the will of God, in other words, nothing of what you did is your fault, the suffering you're going through is not your fault, then he says, then what you need to do is commit yourself, commit your soul, and the Greek word is life, commit your life to the, and he doesn't say the Lord, he says creator. I'll get to that in a minute. But he says, commit yourself to him in doing good. Huh, that's interesting. In other words, you're to rejoice, you're to glorify God, and just go do good. Now, we could go through this book and point out all the ways he said you could do something good. He's talked about it throughout the whole book. Uh, submitting to government in chapter 2, especially 2.15. Submitting to human masters, your boss. Chapter 2, verse 20. Wives submitting to a husband who doesn't know the Lord. Chapter 3, especially verse 6. All believers are to do good in all of life. He expanded on that in chapter 3, verses 8 to 10. So he has constantly, um, chapter verses 8 to 12, I should say. Uh, especially when you're suffering for righteousness sake. So doing good then, in this book, includes submission and service. Taken from all of those references to all of those things that I just mentioned. It is doing what is right and it is doing what is helpful. So, if you're undergoing a trial, go figure out how to be helpful. I think that's one of the finest pieces of advice I could give you, and I learned it years ago by studying the book of James. The book of James starts out, count it all joy when you fall into various kinds of trials. And it ends by saying, and go help the fatherless and widows in their affliction. Because you see, when you, when you are undergoing suffering of any kind, to any degree, the tendency is to feel woe is me and to start thinking about nothing but yourself. And the finest thing you could do is give yourself away. Amen. Go help somebody else. Amen. Do good. Now, back to verse 19. You're to commit your life to him by going and spending your life doing good don't crawl in your shell. Don't become a hermit. Go help people. As if to a faithful creator. Now, what is he saying? <laughs> He's saying God is faithful. 
and he is the creator. So implied in this is he's faithful to you so you can trust him. Mm -hmm. Only instead of mentioning that he's God, he mentions that it's the Lord that's the creator. Wow. Faithful creator. So he created the planet. He created you. If you've trusted him, he's committed himself to you. He's given you eternal life. There's nothing you can do to lose it. And he's faithful to all those promises. <laughs> and he's creator. He's got the power to pull this off. My brother uh, tells people who are having struggling with trusting the Lord. He's told me this several times in the last couple of months. Um, he's fascinated by the fact that we're on the planet and it's spinning. I don't know where he's got these figures, but he said it's spinning a thousand miles a minute. Is that right? That's what he said. All right? And he's able to keep you on it stable. So you think he could help you handle this problem you got? He's a faithful creator. He created the planet that you're standing on. He can handle it. So just go trust him. He is trustworthy. Uh, matter of fact, the word commit here was used of, uh, in the ancient world of committing money to somebody for safekeeping. They didn't have banks. So if you were going to go somewhere uh, and you needed to leave money to take care of the family or something, you gave it to a faithful friend. And that friend was morally obligated to faithfully dispose of the money the way you wanted. Matter of fact, uh, I'm going to skip forward a lot of years. Uh, you ever heard of a living trust? You know what a living trust is legally? You know, how, you know where those kind of things got started? With the Crusades. The men who went off to fight the Crusades left their estate in the hands of a trusted friend, the trustee, to take care of his family while he was going off to Jerusalem to fight the Crusades. And that's where we got the idea of a trust. Well, that goes back to the ancient world where they committed their money to somebody and trusted them to handle it. And they took this very, very seriously. So when Peter uses this word that uh, you're to commit yourself to him and he's faithful, he's saying you commit yourself to the Lord and you can trust him because he will pull this off. There's an ancient historian named Herodias who wrote a story of a man who went to Sparta in Greece because he had heard of the strict honor of the Spartans. He trusted his money to a man, a Spartan, and said that in due time his sons would reclaim the money and would bring a token that would establish their identity beyond any doubt. Sometime later, the sons showed up, and the Spartan said he had no recollection of any money being entrusted to him and that he wished to think about it. The sons warned him that he must return the money, which he did. Soon after that, he died, and all of his family died with him. Herodias says in the time that he lived, there was not a single member of his family left alive because the gods, small g, was angry that he had even contemplated breaking the trust imposed in him. Even to think of evading such a trust was a mortal sin in the minds of the ancients in Sparta. So the author of that story said, if such a trust is sacred to men, how much more is it sacred to to God. The persecuted Christian can trust the Lord. The Lord will not 
fail you. So the bottom, bottom line of this is just rejoice, manifest the Lord, go do some good to somebody else, and trust the Lord to give you the grace and power to do it in the meantime. So, when you suffer for Christ, don't think it's strange, and don't be ashamed. Just commit yourself to the Lord by doing what is right. Rejoice. Glorify God. He can be trusted to take care of you, and he will eventually take care of those who hurt you. In the end, you will be glorified and glad, and they will be severely judged and sad. Wow. What a spiritual truth. So, when you are suffering at the hands of somebody else, the tendency is to feel like a victim, to want to retaliate. If you're going to murder somebody, uh, you're going to suffer, so don't do that. You don't want to spend the rest of your life in an orange suit. So don't do that. So what do you do? You rejoice. And you just don't pay any attention to them. Let the Lord deal with them. Amen? There is the story of a judge who had been frequently ridiculed by conceited lawyers. When asked by a friend why he didn't rebuke the assailant, he replied, In our town lives a widow who has a dog. Whenever the moon shines, it goes outside and barks all night. Having said that, the magistrate shifted the conversation to another subject. Finally, someone asked, But judge, what about the dog and the moon? Oh, he replied, the moon went on shining. <laughs> that's all. And that's what you're to do. No matter how those dogs bark, you just shine. Some will hate you. Some will love you. Some will flatter and some will slight. Cease from man and look above you. Trust in God and do what's right. Father.